Well, we've completed our review of First Thessalonians, five chapters, and we're now going to undertake what I, with my tongue in my cheek, called Third Thessalonians. Don't look for it in your Bible, because I'd be very surprised if you have Third Thessalonians in your Bible. But I'll explain why I'm using that particular term, because that way you'll remember a fundamental about what we're going to study here. And we're going to be in chapter 1 of what I'm going to somewhat facetiously call Third Thessalonians. And so let's first of all realize that what Paul told his protege, Timothy, he said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And uh, all Scripture... All Scripture. Now he was primary reference was, the old, with, was to the Old Testament, but even Peter endorses Paul's writings as Scripture in his letters. So we're not going to split those hairs tonight. But it, all Scripture was given by inspiration of God. Now that's that's quite a phrase. That Greek actually says a word that means God breathed. And the more we study the text, the original text, both Old and New Testament the more we're stunned at what the computers reveal about its structure and detail. It has properties that if you take one letter out, they evaporate. We begin to realize that not only did Moses get the Torah from God, he gave it to him letter by letter. And we, we, we find those same kinds of characteristics scattered through the New Testament also. All scriptures give an inspiration to God for four primary, it's profitable for four primary reasons. For doctrine, what does that mean? For what tells you what's right. For reproof, that tells you what's not right. And for correction, that's how to get it right. And for instruction, how to stay right. See, when I say doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction, those are abstractions. They don't rattle when you shake them. But I'll tell you, it tells you what's right, what's not right, how to get it right, and then how to stay right. That's operative, isn't it? With me? Okay. Yes, it's going to be one of those nights, you can tell. Okay, great. Now, if we look at the primary uh, 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 epistles here, we have Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. Those are not in chronological order. Romans, of course, is one of the principal epistles about doctrine. First and second Corinthians are the reproof of those doctrines. Galatians, how to correct those doctrines. All three of those have to do with soteriology as its primary emphasis. Soteriology is study of salvation. How do you get saved and so forth. So the doctrine of that and and the reproof and correction are those, the first three. Another major doctrinal epistle is the, the epistle of the Ephesians. And Philippians are the reproof to that, and Colossians the correction of that. And that is doctrine having to do with ecclesiology. What is ecclesiology? The study of the church, the mystical church. We're not talking about church buildings. We're talking about the real church, the church that Christ is building. And we, that we are a part of it. Now, First and Second Thessalonians are also doctrinal, and they're unique because they're the primary, it turns out, they're the primary epistles for eschatology. Among the epistles, a lot of important books on uh, uh, epistles, uh, a lot of important passages on uh, uh, eschatology. In fact, the real way to get at it, the reason eschatology is so difficult for many, it requires the whole counsel of God. It leans very heavily on the entire package. So you don't you avoid one verse theology in general, certainly with eschatology. But in the New Testament epistles, we'll discover that the first two epistles that Paul wrote, apparently were the first and second Thessalonians, and they are become our most precious resources from an eschatological or end time point of view. So the Thessalonian epistles, the most important eschatological or end time epistles of the New Testament. First Thessalonians, we just finished. It among its many treasures, it ha- it's the key one of the key passages of the harpazo, the rapture, as it's called in the Latin. It also deals with, as we noticed last time in, section, in chapter 5 of that first epistle, the day of the Lord, a widely misunderstood term, by the way. We know it also as the day of wrath in some passages. It's called the, uh, 
uh, time of Jacob's trouble by Jeremiah. Those are all evidencing this particular period of time called the Day of the Lord. Many people misunderstand a remark that John makes on Patmos in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And maybe people, that must mean it's Sunday. No, it isn't. Nowhere in the New Testament is it called Sunday the Lord's Day. What it should be translated is the Day of the Lord. Oh, he was transported in spirit into that period of time known as the Day of the Lord, about which Joel spends chapter 2 and, other, and, and on and on. So that Day of the Lord, we're going to talk more about that, but we had that concept uh, last time in chapter 5 of First Thessalonians. Well, we're now in, I'm going to suggest to you that there apparently was a forgery floating around that I'm facetiously calling Second Thessalonians. Apparently a forgery by Paul. Because Third Thessalonians, as I'm facetiously calling it here, was Paul's response to that forgery. So I'm calling, what, I, what, what I'm calling Third Thessalonians is that letter which we have in our Bibles that's labeled Second Thessalonians. And I'm just indulging in this to get across the idea that part, the reason this Second Thessalonian letter was written is in response to a forgery, and that's not a problem. You won't understand it unless you understand what that forgery apparently said and why they were so upset about it. Okay? That's why I'm making this emphasis here. All right. Now, this, 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 the, the, uh, this so-called third epistle of, of Thessalonians, Paul's response to the second one, will deal among... It's going to be very precious to us. It's very brief. It's three short chapters. But chapter 2 will be a key to understanding the sequence of end-time events. There are lots of debates and good scholars that have different views about exactly what sequence things happen. And we're going to get a great insight into all of that by studying very carefully, very precisely, second chapter of, second Thess of, of, of what we call Second Thessalonians. Okay. First Thessalonians it started by looking back it talked about the conversion evangelism and the aftercare of that early church. Remember, Paul was there three weeks and then later wrote them a letter. And so what he wrote about was what he had taught them in the first three weeks of that church's history. And then that, that first epistle then looks, uh, looked forward and dealt with what we know as the harpazo, or commonly called the rapture. Okay. Now, Second Thessalonians, it followed the First Thessalonians by only a few months, apparently, in the opinion of some experts. One of the things to understand in the context that they're experiencing here is persecutions have begun. There have been all kinds of uproars throughout Paul's ministry. The first missionary journey, all that. Lots of uproar. They were caused by Jews stirring up trouble. But now we're starting to see, at this point in time, the beginnings of persecution by the Roman Empire. In the previous context, the primary passion of the Roman administration was to keep peace. No they got upset when there was any uprising and problems. The Jewish leadership, when it, it, they would constantly stir up problems with Paul, and um, uh, it, it was, but it was, inst that's one thing that especially the, the uh, writings of Luke, in both the book of Acts and as well as the Gospel of Luke, emphasize. But here are these things, now the, thing, the tide's changing here. The persecutions had begun. Pliny the Elder writes as follows, It was in Thessalonica that the first Gentiles were killed in the Roman Empire. Think about that. The local Roman governor in that part of the country said that every Christian had to bow before a statue of Augustus Caesar. He had been deified, and statues of Caesar were erected everywhere. Christians who didn't obey the edict were persecuted. So this, is, this, this persecution was key to emperor worship, which of course the Gentiles refused to do. The Gentile Christians refused to do. It was in Thessalonica that they dreamed up the procedure of offering a cask of wine on the altar to Venus or Caesar and then publicly taking it out to the marketplace and sprinkling it on all the vegetables and on the meat and other goods, announcing that it had all been dedicated to God. See, they did that deliberately. Why? Because anyone who bought or ate of it thereby worshipped a false god. Christians who stopped buying the in the marketplace as a witness immediately became marked. 
the first crucifixions, the first burnings, and the first great persecutions of Christians began then. So this is important to understand. And ask yourself a question now. Why would the church in Thessalonica be upset about that? They obviously didn't like persecution. Who does? But they began to assume that they either had been mistaught or the rapture had taken place or they'd missed it or something. They, they were upset because this didn't fit their understanding or expectations eschatologically. So let's look at the second epistle of the Thessalonians. I'll call it Our, Our Blessed Hope Part 2. The first chapter is going to talk about the present distress that they're experiencing because the persecutions have begun. The second chapter will deal with the order of events that we're going to want to really understand for lots of reasons. We're going to discover that the whole Thessalonican church was upset by, among other things, a, an apparent forgery that was being circulated, either circulated or alluded to. Somebody said they had a private letter from Paul and it said such and so, and they're all upset. One of the things you've got to think through is why were they upset? What is it possible that Paul might have said in this forgery that got them so unglued? So unglued that Paul felt compelled to write a letter in, re in rebuttal. That's what we're dealing with here. We're going to discuss, as we go in the sequence of events, it, 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 we get in this strange theological posture. It's coming soon, but not yet. They're supposed to expect it at any moment, and yet, not yet. Then the final chapter will wrap it up in terms of how we, work, we should work for the night is coming. Okay, let's just read the first chapter through to get a flavor of the thing, and then we'll go back and unpack it verse by verse. It starts out, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of, Thessal of the Thessal Thessalonians, unto the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. I didn't get that with the right southern inference there. That every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. You see, we know Paul was a southerner, we didn't know, but he's not a Texan, because the Philippian letter he says he's learned in whatever state he finds himself there and to be content. So we know he's not a Texan. <laughs> but anyway, going on. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you is believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our, good, our, <clears throat> that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all good pleasure of his goodness and work of his faith and power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the letter. It starts out, verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of Thessalonians in God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he includes the greetings of two other guys. Silas, which is his short contraction, if you will, of Silvanus, which is the Greek, and Timothy which is Tim, uh, uh, Timotheus, is Timothy in the Greek form. These three men, by the way, understand they, ha they, they endured a great deal, all three of them, for the gospel. Paul and Silas were pr in prison together at Philippi. Paul, Silas, and Timothy had gone to Thessalonica. Paul had to leave them. He waited for them in Athens, and finally they caught up with him in Corinth. And it was at that time that Paul wrote his first epistle to the Thessalonians to answer some of their questions. That's what we went through in the first chapter. Okay, 
And it's unto, see, epistles were written to the church, not from the church. Nothing authoritative comes from the church, as J. Vernon McGee would loves to point out. It doesn't teach, it is to be taught, okay? But to, the, the uh, church of Thessalonians in God. In other words, it's a sound local church. What you're going to discover here, there's no criticism of any of their doctrines. Okay. Paul continues, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace always comes first, then peace. Because it's, it's because of his grace we have peace. And grace is the greatest need of the human heart. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Now the word bound there is the word for paying a debt. See, he owes it to them to thank God for them. Get that concept across. It's very important. See, we are bound to thank God always for you. See, it's, it, it, he regards that he has an obligation, like paying a debt, to, to uh, uh, thank God for them. Because, as it is meat. That's an old-fashioned way of saying proper. It was meat. It's an old English way of meaning it was proper because of your faith growth and so forth. Because that's your faith growth exceeding and the charity of every one of you. Here's that old-fashioned word. In the Greek, it's agape. Char in, in Latin, it's caritas, which means once meant it originally meant love that's dispensed to others, like benevolence, benevolent goodwill, motivated by Christian love. Unfortunately, the word charity today really has taken on the coloration of just being a dole or a handout. And, uh, but anyway, it, so we, we now, would, in a more modern way, we would translate the, you know, the love of every one of you. Uh, 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 their faith continued to grow in faith. And, and uh, in answer to Paul's prayers, as he, Paul mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we had that same emphasis back there and also chapter 4. Now, it's interesting that hope is not mentioned here. And uh, it's an unwarranted interpretation that the Christian hope was creating confusion in their minds. That's not what's confusing. There is something con causing confusion. That ain't it. But there is a practical problem Paul is dealing with here before we go on any further. How should we deal with Christians who are doing well in their discipleship? That sounds like a strange question, isn't it? It's an interesting problem. One thing you can do is say, well done. That borders on flattery and has a risk of promoting pride and may rob God of his glory. Think about that. That's a problem. I don't want to, you know, build on someone's pride. Boy, you're doing well. That opens the door for some stumbling here, doesn't it? Well, the alternative is to keep your comments privately in prayers and say nothing. Well, if you do that, that permits discouragement, doesn't it? So that's a dilemma to think about. The third possibility, and that's what Paul chooses to do here. He thanks God for them and tells them he is doing so. He affirms without flattery. He encourages without puffing up. See the subtlety there? That's a little skill that you might be sensitive to. So Paul doesn't flatter them. He thanks God for them and their progress. He thanks God for their progress. Interesting ellipsis going on there. Are we growing in faith every day? Do you trust the Lord in all things? Or you just trust God for the things which you allow? <laughs> Rather than be concerned with what He allows. Or do the urgent things preempt the important? Boy, that's a threat in every one of our lives. The urgent things tend to displace the important things. Think about that. Tribulation works patience, patience experience, and experience hope, according to Romans 5. Well, let's continue verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. There's that word patience. The actual Greek word means remaining under, like under a load or something of that nature. You have to remember the storm is what measures the sailor, not the calm sea. You find out what kind of a sailor you are in a storm, not in a calm sea. You won't find out what kind of a pilot you are until you've had to make a real forced landing. The practice ones don't really tell you. 
when you've had to make your first real forced landing, you discover how you put together. Interesting. You realize Paul had his own trials in Corinth, and that was going on while this letter was being written to them. Interesting. Verse 5, which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. And we talked about persecution a little bit earlier, and that, of course, is very heavily influenced by Revelation 6, from verse 9 to 11, and so on. See, we're not left on this earth in order to be popular. We're here to cause ferment and uproar, hatred and strife. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 34. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. Now that's not a license just to be obnoxious. That's not a license just to create a, an irrelevant uh, uh, furor of some kind. No, but it is a call to stand. As what, Ju what Jude would say, to contend for your faith. Continuing, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. You see, the principle of requital li lies at the very basis of our belief in a moral universe. Not good, but evil creates a moral problem for us. We have a tough time dealing with the existence of evil. We have a tough time dealing with that to, in, in terms of a moral universe. But clearly, pre present injustices require a future retribution. But it's God's retribution, not ours. That's the tough lesson to learn. A world in which justice was not done at last would not be God's world at all. But he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Again and again throughout the scripture, but most notably in Romans 12. See, retribution is pictured as overtaking men in the world to come, but there are passages which indicate that it may also operate here and now. And, that, and, and Romans 1 deals with that and, and a lot of other passages. But the main underscoring observation is that all that live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. We're not greater than the Master, and he, they persecuted him. So persecution is not the same thing as a period coming which is defined by Christ himself as the great tribulation. That's a very special case we're going to deal with when we get to the next chapter. Okay. Remember the promise to Timothy. Everybody misses one of these words here. It says, if you suffer with him, you will also reign with him. There's a widespread presumption within the Christian body that if you're, a, if you're saved, if you're in Christ, you're going to rule with him. It doesn't say that. You may be eligible for the opportunity, yes, but you'll notice whenever that's talked about, there's a conditional in front of it. What's the first two-letter word in that sentence? If. If you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. Think about it. You need to be a metakoi, a partaker. That's really what you're called to. And there'll be, there, there'll be people in heaven that are saved that are not necessarily ruling with him. There's going to be all kinds of people in the kingdom. There'll be subjects and sovereigns. And that's a whole study we won't derail tonight, but let's go on. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And he goes on. He's speaking here of the day of the Lord. And that's for the next, uh, the, uh, next four verses, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And uh, we covered some of that in the previous two chapters of Thessalonians, uh, uh, chapter, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. Now, he comes for his saints, but now he's coming with them. Chapter 4 and 5, he came for his saints. He snatched them forcibly. The word harpazo means. But now he's coming with his saints. Hmm. Matthew 25 deals with the judgment of the Gentiles. Ezekiel 20 deals with the judgment of the Jews. Not necessarily simultaneously, different occasions, but they're well dealt with in the Scripture. Moving on. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who? Vengeance. This is not vindictiveness. 
simply the administration of unwavering justice. God's holiness is at stake here. You know, it's interesting as we touch on this, I'm doing a, a, a personal study re-examining the issue of the fear of God. So many people misunderstand that. I have been given several wonderful sermons and messages on, well, it doesn't mean terror, it means reverent, reverential awe. And there are places, there's 17 different words involved, by the way, in the study. That's one of them. And so, uh, yes, very often uh, we're called to a rever reverential awe, in awe of God, no question. No, there are also places that the men of God trembled before His Majesty. There's a place for that. And there's an, we need to understand Yes, we're beneficiaries of His grace, praise God. We're beneficiaries of His mercy, praise God. But let's never lose sight of the fact that He's God, and He's a holy God. You know, it was a few generations ago, you took comfort in a case where you discovered that one of our elected officials or a judge or somebody was a God-fearing man. That was a common phrase in our vocabulary, well, he's a God-fearing person. I might have some doctrinal difference of view with him, but he's a God-fearing person. Do you ever hear that phrase today? It's, it's absent from our vocabulary. There are many politicians that would shun that label. They're not, they, they're not trying to pose as a God-fearing. They're anxious not to be labeled God-fearing because that might hurt their re-election possibilities or something. I mean, how, how far we've fallen. Absolutely stunning to see how far we've fallen. And... Uh, we don't understand that we have had a sense of security in our country because we're not a democracy, we're a republic. What's the difference? A republic is subject to the rule of law. And we could take comfort in the Constitution. It protects our rights. There's a Bill of Rights. We, we take comfort that we're protected, not by a personality, but by a rule of law. And what is terrifying to us today is the, as we examine that, is that it's no longer operative. We're no longer under a rule of law. The Constitution isn't being followed. We have a president who refuses to even show his birth certificate to demonstrate he's qualified. And we go on and on with judges. We go on and on with the educational establishment. We go on and on with the uh, financial and legal. Uh, every sector of society is no longer lawful. It's not illegal. It's lawless. And lawlessness is one of the signs we're going to talk about when we get to the next chapter. We have a right to be terrified because of the absence of the rule of law in our culture. We've come to take that for granted, except in our recent memory, we have Vicki Weaver assassinated by the head of the FBI. She had no charges against her. It's interesting, though, another aspect of this is an example of how the early church ascribed functions to the Lord Jesus Christ that the Old Testament reserved for yod heh vav or the Yahweh, or the, however you want to pronounce it. You quickly discover by the ascriptions here that what was yod heh vav in the Old Testament becomes a Lord Jesus Christ in the New. Realize that those become congruent concepts. Now when you get to the field of eschatology, the study of the end times, the first why in the road, many people have different views, but your first fundamental choice point is, are you amillennial or premillennial? As you obviously know, most of us here hold the view that the millennium that the Bible talks about is very true, very literal, going to happen. In fact, it's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And that's what ties the whole thing together. I'm not here to get into that more, because I think most of us uh, understand that. But, but we, many people don't realize what amillennial includes. The amillennialist thinks that the millennium, Revelation 20, is just allegorical. And uh, <clears throat> he treats the scripture with what's called a soft hermeneutic. That this is just symbolic, it's just uh, allegorical, what have you. Now the day, this is not just a difference in viewpoint. The amillennialist, whether he realizes or not, runs the risk of calling God a liar. Because he ends up having to explain away or dismiss or put under the carpet dozens and dozens of commitments by God to Israel that he argues is not going to happen. And that's a very dangerous position to be in. I, and I don't want to get into all that except to alert you to that. That's the, the dangers there. Now, 
See, amillennialism makes God guilty of not keeping his unconditional covenants to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the Jews. That is the nation Israel. What are the seen? Promise of the land in Genesis 12 and 13 and 17. Promise of the land, a kingdom and a greater, to the greater son of David, the Messiah as king. And Psalm 89 alone is, lays that all out. The promise of restoration to the land of Israel from the worldwide dispersion establishment of Messiah's kingdom. That's all in the scripture in Jeremiah 31 and in about four major chapters of Ezekiel. Hammer that home. And promise that the, any remnant of the Israelites will be saved is also laid out in the New Testament as well as the Old. Now, so as we study eschatology, that's our first choice. There, is, there was a view called post-millennial. There were people that argued, well, we're already in the millennium. As we got into the 20th century, which is the bloodiest century in human history, that, that, that view really uh, evaporated and took some out of views. Preterism is a form of amillennialism, and uh, post-constructionism is also a form of post-millennial. But most of us here are premillennial, and so I, I, won't re I won't rehash all of that, except to highlight that within that view, th the question is, will the church go through the Great Tribulation or not? Okay. Is the rapture take place after the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, or before the tribulation? Well, if you think the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation, that's called post-tribulationalism. If you think it's somewhere in the middle of Daniel's 70 weeks, they call themselves mid-tribulationalists. It's an awkward label for a lot of reasons. But pre-tribulation is what most of us are. Now, the real point I'm making is, if I know how you feel about the text, the Word of God, I can predict where you'll come out. See, most denominations today, of the, especially the denominations, came out, the denominations which came out of the Reformation, are uh, amillennial and post-tribulational. They inherit an eschatology of Augustine, which is amillennial, and the tribulation idea, they think the church will go through the tribulation. That's their view. Those of us that would be labeled by many as fundamentalists, we take the Bible literally, we take it seriously, is the way I would put it, we are premillennial and pre-tribulational. Now, the reason I'm making this point, it's not what, that one is right or wrong. That's not the point. Good, sol good scholars have different views. But if I, know your if I know your hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation, if you're willing to allegorize major portions of Scripture, I know you'll be on the left side of this chart. You'll drift towards being amillennial and post-tribulational. That's a classic view among many theologians. And a lot of good minds have written books on that for centuries. If you take the Bible very seriously, I'll say literally, you're on the right end of this. And you'll fall somewhere between these depending on your hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation. You with me so far? That's going to be useful to you as we go. Not that we're right or wrong. That's not my point here. Okay. See, amillennialism began with Augustine back in the 4th uh, century. Uh, and he leaned heavily on the, or, uh, the uh, allegorizations of origin. And uh, it also became the, found that became the foundation of anti-Semitism. I've written papers on the, going from Augustine to Auschwitz because there's a direct link. If you want to blame the Holocaust on anyone, you blame it to the pulp, the silent pulpits in Germany during those early years. But it's reviving again. That's one reason I'm bringing this up. You're going to see amillennialism in the form of predatorism and other things rise, and that's going to open the door for the church to become anti-Semitic, anti-Israel. Watch out for that. That does. We get a lot of mail by people who are really upset because they think that uh, many of us are too soft on Israel and too hostile to the Palestinians. No, we're not. The Palestinians are following a myth that's not historically correct, but that's not the point. Those that are Christians, we should pray for and, and, and have compassion for. The fact that Jewish doesn't make them right, we don't agree with Israel's po uh, politics. That's not the point. Dis distinguish the national realities from the, 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 our posture as, uh, to, uh, to them as believers and so on. So anyway... If we get a post-tribulationist, there's a number of major uh, writers, Gundry and Ladd are perhaps the best, Walter Martin leaned that way, that's a little more complicated, but uh, Pat Robertson, Jim McKeever, these are classical post-tribulationists. There are mid-tribulationists around, Harrison, J. Sidlow Baxter, I like his books, I learn a lot from them, but I don't happen to agree with that eschatology. Marv Rosenthal has a fabulous ministry, great ministry, but his book, so-called Pre-Wrath, is not taken seriously by most serious students of eschatology for a lot of reasons. Uh, so that doesn't happen to be his strongest suit. Pre-tribulation, of course, include the classic of, by Dwight Pentecost, certainly John Walvoord, Ryrie, Feinberg, Fruchtenbaum, Charles Dyer, Grant Jeffrey, Chuck Smith, Tim LaHaye, and ourselves and others are in that category. And uh, anyway, moving on. Verse 9. 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. You know, it's interesting how there's very little in, uh, in the Scriptures about heaven. It's an interesting, interesting study. Uh, in fact, uh, don't confuse heaven with the kingdom from heaven. There's a lot said about the kingdom from heaven that, come, that Jesus is going to set up on the earth and rule for a thousand years. That's not heaven. It's the kingdom from heaven. So that's one of the reasons we have some fuzzy notions about heaven and many people confuse the kingdom of heaven with the kingdom from heaven. Because we've discovered that in Matthew, who's the only one that uses that term, it's a genitive of source, not a genitive of apposition. Meaning that it's the kingdom that came from heaven. It's on the earth, has a capital, has a king, the floor plan of the palace is in nine chapters of the, the last nine chapters of Ezekiel and so on. But there's very little uh, scripture about heaven itself. There's even less by, about hell. There's some idioms used, and we know enough about it that we really don't want to know any more about it. Okay? Jesus said more about it than anyone else did, by the way. So you can't deal with that subject without dealing with what Jesus said about that subject. But these verses here say it all, really. And I want to highlight, though, there's no such thing as annihilation. That's a physical concept, and we're here in the non-physical realm. The concept of annihilation is just not in Scripture. We'd love to believe that the lost will just disappear. Okay, if you're not saved, you're gonna, it just ends it all. No, it doesn't, because you're eternal whether you're saved or not. And that's, the, that's the heavy uh, issue that's in front of us. We talked about that last time. Eternal uh, destruction is simply separation from the Lord. The final disaster is forever. You and I have no grasp to imagine what being separated permanently from God himself means to us. And so these other things are idioms to try to get across those implications. Anyway, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and be admired in all of them that believe, because a testimony among you was believed in that day. Glorified in. Interesting construction. Glorified in. Not glorified among them, like in a theater or a stadium. Not glorified by them, as if they were spectators, like an audience that watches and worships. No, no. Not through them, or by means of them, as if they were be mirrors that reflect His image and glory. That's not what he's talking about. The Greek construction here is very emphatic and very specific. But rather as a filament, which itself glows with light and heat when energy passes through it. A dramatic way to demonstrate would have a, to have a clear light bulb here with a filament in it, which is off. We turn it on. The filament itself is, the, is, the, is, is it's glorified in the filament. That's what this uh, in means. See, a theater isn't changed by the play that's performed in it. A mirror is not affected by the images that it reflects. You and I are going to be changed. Not just reflecting, we're going to be changed. And the transfiguration of Christ in Matthew 17 is a glimmer of that, if you will. And he continues, Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That word always is what you should take from this verse. We constantly pray for you. Present tense, continuing in other words. It's prayer that links the future with the present. Although the future of God's people is secure, we should not presume upon it. Live a life worthy of the destiny that God has in store. Paul is mindful that they still had to live out their faith in the hard world of men who oppose themselves to the things of God. I really like that. See, prayer is the way to link the present with the future. Prayer is God's way of enlisting you in what He wants to do. Work of faith. I love that phrase. See, faith is always busy. Faith is not a static thing. It's a transitive verb. It implies action. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The name. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the name, the concept of name uh, was intended to sum up the whole character of a person. Well, it makes that particularly provocative because in Revelation chapter 2 we discover Jesus is going to give us a new name. 
He has a new name, and it's a secret. Something is Yorevave Tsitkanu. I sure hope not. That's hard to pronounce. But anyway, okay. Now, are we living our lives as a means of being glory to the Savior? And people ask me, is it okay for us to do this or that or the other thing? The question is, does it bring glory to the Savior? If you can answer that question, you've got the answer to your question. Well, can, can a Christian play golf? Sure, I think so. Does it bring glory to the Savior? There are places, where, there are places it would. There's places it wouldn't. Are we really manifesting Christ as his trophies of grace, that we belong to him and that he belongs to us? See, that's the whole thing. Are you demonstrating that we belong to Christ? And also that he belongs to us. That's the challenge. Well, can a Christian do X? Well, answer my, if you answer my question, I'll answer yours. Does it bring glory to Christ? You answer that, and I'll answer your question. Okay, now I'm going to cheat a little bit because we finished 1 Thessalonians. When we get to 2 Thessalonians, there's some very big issues we're going to be dealing with. So I want to take a sneaking peek of just a couple of verses of next chapter, partly because it colors some of the assertions I've made already, and partly to get those that are behind us so that we can really focus on the part of the book that are going to bother you the most uh, in, the, in our next session. So let's just take a quick preliminary glance at chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh boy, we're talking about his return then, aren't we? This suddenly became very eschatological, didn't it? We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by our gathering together unto him. What on earth could that mean? What are the possibilities of that? We just finished 1 Thessalonians. We just finished chapter 5. What are we talking about here? Of course, the coming, the word is parousia. There are three words that you find used that are almost equivalent, but yet... By the way, the other thing I want you to carry away from our studies is a respect for precision. If you adopt the policy that there are no such things as absolute synonyms, you'll be very close to the truth. Things you think are synonymous usually turn out to be not quite synonymous, and often in the distinction is a very important distinction. There are three terms you encounter about the appearance or unveiling or presence of Jesus Christ. The first one is parousia. That's what's being used here. And, and that's, that's with his presence, in effect. Parousia. That lays emphasis on the very presence of the Lord with his people. Okay. Another word is epiphania. That's the manifestation of the power and love of God. That occurs in a number of passages. And then, of course, there's apocalypsis, which really means the unveiling or the revelation of God's purpose and plan in the second coming. All three of these are used in one way or another in the second. The word here is parousia. It means it's, actually, it's emphasized His presence, the presence of the Lord Jesus, and by our gathering together unto Him. And that, of course, I, I assert, is referring to the rapture, the rapazzo. We've just gotten through 1 Thessalonians, which really elaborated on that concept. And by our gathering together him, he's referring to the harpazo, as was quoted in chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. And our being forever with the Lord thereafter. Remember in John 14, I go and prepare a place for you, and, and come to and bring you to myself, and with me, with me there, there ye shall be also. And so, in Matthew 24, and Mark 13, that is also emphasized. Okay, our gathering together unto him. Okay. Get to the second verse. This is very pivotal of our understanding of this entire letter. Paul is writing them, that ye be not so, uh, so soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Your Bibles may say day of Christ. That's a mistranslation. The word is not Christos, it's kurios. It's day of the Lord. For some reason the King James has that twisted, but anyway. That ye be not so soon shaken in mind. These people were upset. That's why Paul is writing the letter. Because he's in Corinth, he's heard that they've gotten all upset by something, and he suspects uh, 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 that they were by spirit, someone speaking prophetically, or by word, or by letter as from us. 
either they had a letter that is a forgery or someone is claiming that they had a private letter from Paul saying such and so. The point is, though, they're all upset. They're so upset that Paul feels compelled to write to them. Why? That she be not so soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit and so forth. Okay. This is the first aorist passive infinitive of seleo, which means to agitate, to cause to totter like a reed. They're being, uh, he, he expected them to be more stable. They're not being stable, they're upset. And he's trying to respond to that. Why are you so troubled by spirit, by word, or a letter from us that the day of the Lord is at hand? Not, nor by letter as from us. Apparently this whole thing has been prompted by the circulation of a spurious letter, either actually or by hearsay. Apparently an intentional forgery, fretting that they were, that they were already in the day of the Lord. Now what you want to, when you study the coming chapters, what you want to try to answer, answer the question for yourself, what is it that they're upset about that caused Paul to have to write this letter? They have come to a conclusion that's got him upset. And Paul's going to try to straighten that out. But you won't understand him straightening it out until you understand what it is that they're upset about. You with me? You often don't understand the answer to a question if you don't know what the question is. So what is it they're bothered by? Is one of the questions that lurks behind our study here. One of the things we discover is that they think that they are already in the day of the Lord. Now I'm going to offer a suggestion, a possibility. If they were post-tribulationists, they wouldn't be upset. They wouldn't mind. I mean, they wouldn't, wouldn't like persecution, but that would cause them to be, a boy, it's getting closer. No, they're upset because they think that they've either been mistaught or something's wrong because they didn't expect to be in the day of the Lord. Now, the persecutions they have haven't started the day of the Lord. They don't know that, right? But that's, a, that's going to turn out to be an important factor. How do you tell? He's going to show them next time. Why would that bother Christians in Thessalonica? You need, to un you need to come to terms with that to really understand what we're getting into here. See, Paul had plainly said that Jesus would come as a thief in the night and had shown that the dead would not be left out in the harpazo. Okay, so had the harpazo happened? Apparently not. And yet, the day of the Lord has started. That contradicted their understanding of the eschatology. So Paul is going to straighten them out. But you need to understand what he's straightening out because we're all going to have that same concern. Evidently, someone claimed to have a private epistle from Paul which supported the view that Jesus was coming at once as that the day of the Lord is now present. And Paul is going to say, no, it's not, and here's why. You with me? But underscoring both of their views, the view that Paul had and the view that they should have, it's a pre tribulation view. That means the rapture will come before the great tribulation. Not that there won't be tribu the, you know, persecution, tribulation, small t, but that great tribulation, which has a specific definition, we'll deal with next time. So he continues, that she be not so, uh, shake, so soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of the Lord shall be hand. Now that day of the Lord is not what your King James says. It says the day of Christ, and because it's mistranslated, you miss the point. It's the day of the Lord. Yes, it's the day of Christ, but it's the day of the Lord as a, a label for a, a period of time about which the Bible says a lot. It's a major preoccupation of the book of Joel. It's a major uh, 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 disclosure by Christ himself in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. But the, the actual Greek uses the word kurios, which is the day of the Lord, and that helps us link that all together, if you will. So, Let's talk a little bit about eschatology. We're going to get into an area and we're going to tell you why we hold certain views. I, don't, I want to underscore again and again, that doesn't mean we're right. We're going to try to share with you why we hold certain views. You, we're, we're anxious for you to develop your own tools and background and perspective to come to your own conclusions. And if we share with you our view, it's only for, it's for two reasons. To show you our methodology on the one hand and to be helpful in terms of saving some effort on another, but we want to, we, we're anxious to raise up what we call self-feeders. That's what the Institute's all about. We have a common statement of faith that's in our handbook that is something I think all of you will agree with, but on, on top of that, you, you uh, 
May the Spirit be with you. Be with you. So, but the rapture is not a doctrine to argue about. It's a doctrine to live. We should live in the ever moment, ever moment by moment expectation of His return. He's taught us to do that. Some believe that he's coming after the tribulation. We don't, but some very good people do feel that way. Some believe that he's coming before the, tribu tri the tribulation. We side with those people. Some believe that he's coming during, or as, as they're sometimes called, mid-tribulationists. Each one of these has very notable scholars in their camp. And we're not here to disparage any one of them. And we'll show you why we hold the views we do to be helpful, not to sell them particularly. But the real question is, how does your interpretation affect your life? Does it do anything for you? That's the key question you need to ask yourself continually. If your view has no effect on your life, then you might reconsider what you believe. Because they're intended to have an impact on your life. There's a passage in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. It's in effect an elliptical quote from Isaiah 63. But it says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Ooh, that's a disturbing question. The Greek there requires a negative answer to that rhetorical question. When he returns in power, will he find a faithless world? That seems to be the suggestion, okay? Now let's talk a little bit about what we know about a prophetic fo profile from Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Jesus wrote seven letters to seven churches, and you want to, the most important book of the Bible, the only book in the Bible that has a promise to the person that reads it. No other book of the Bible has the audacity to say, read me, I'm special, but one book does, the book of Revelation. The most important sentence in that book is the first sentence. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Unto whom? Jesus Christ. And he, Jesus Christ, gave it and signified it, signified it to his servant John. But it's a revelation to Christ. Wow! No wonder it's high language. No, and, and everything's in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the Bible. That's what makes it such a treasure hunt. The most important chapters of the book of Revelation are chapters 2 and 3. Chapter 1 is a vision of Christ. We learn a lot from it. That's great. Chapter 4 on is yet future. John says, I was in the Spirit of the Lord. On the, I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. He's transported future. And chapter 4, verse 1 on is post-rapture. I'm not going to try to prove it here. But the point is, the most important part of the most important book is chapter 2 and 3, which is seven letters that Jesus wrote. We're studying Paul's epistles. These are seven epistles by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And they're to seven churches. Why these seven? Because they're representative in some very mystical ways. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And when we study these, they have four different levels of meaning, we discover quite clearly. But one of the most astonishing ones is they lay out a profile of church history in advance. If they were in any other order, it wouldn't be true. But as we study each one and understand each one, we're astonished to discover they profile. And uh, Ephesus was the apostolic church, the challenge of that first century. Sound on doctrine, but they lost their first love. Smyrna, the suffering church. Suffering death. Heavily so. What Satan couldn't accomplish by persecution, he accomplishes by having them marry the world. Pergamos. Bigotry. Bigamy is married to two. Maganami married to one. Pergamos is married to per in a perverted marriage. Pergamos, the married church. The church marries the world. Wow. We could go on and on about that. Thyatira is the medieval church. The church that inherits that, those traditions carries, what we, carries us through a period we call the Dark Ages. And we have Sardis, the denominational church. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. That's Jesus calling that. It's one of two churches that had nothing good said about it. Now, Thyatira is the Vatican. Sardis is the Reformation. Ooh, that hurts. Denominational church. Philadelphia is the missionary church. 
Everybody that studies these knows that they're the Philadelphia church, okay? No, there's parts of all of them in all of us. The last one is the apostate church. And need I tell you where we are? You want to make a guess where we are? Now, we discover as we study these carefully that the first three have something strange. The promises to the overcomer are postscripts. Every, every letter has a special promise to the overcomer. But in the first three, they're postscripted. In the last four, they're in the body of the letter. That tells us of nothing else. The last four are somehow special. We learn something else. The last four have explicit references to the second coming of Christ. Ooh, now we're learning something. We discover one of those four has an explicit, explicit promise that if they don't wake up, they're going to be in the Great Tribulation. Wow, that tells us something. One of them has a promise that it will be removed prior to the time of that tribulation. A couple of others are rather problematic. So we're going to get into more of this next time. But where are we, do you think? Anyone think we're someplace other than Laodicea? Then if we're in the Laodicean church, <laughs> they think they're rich and have need of nothing. You hear these health and wealth prophets, you hear them on television, do you read, just remind you, remember, they're, they're, that's scriptural. That they would, you know, be rich and feel they have need of nothing. Anyway, we'll move on here. There's a, an epistemological cycle. Now, epistemology is the study of knowledge, its scope and limits. It asks the question, how do we know something? Well, there's a, an epistemological cycle in theology you might be interested in. I've shown you how that your hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation, will determine your eschatology. You tell me what you believe, what, where are you on the scale of hermeneutics? You take the Bible very seriously, that will, I, I can predict where you'll end up coming out eschatologically. Okay. A, a link that may surprise you, it surprised me when it first pointed out to me, is that eschatology uh, will determine your ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is a study of the church, the mystical church. And you won't really, you can just study all the doctrines you like, you won't really understand that unless you understand how it fits eschatologically. When your eschatology solidifies, the ecclesiology comes into focus. And that's what we just went through. Okay? Well, as a, to close the link, your ecclesiology, your understanding of the church will determine your hermeneutics. The, 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 the church you worship in, does it, does it use a paraphrase? The message? Is it an NIV church? Or is it in an NASB church? You know, in other words, your, your, your uh, environment there will determine your hermeneutics as to which uh, 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 things you use. Now, is the King James Version better? No, 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 no. It's a, there's few that have its majesty, but that's not why we use it. It's that the problems are well understood and well documented. The others are still being discovered. But that's one of the reasons that we're thinking seriously of starting to uh, offer expositional studies in the International Standard Version, which is about, it's just weeks away from being completed. And we've been asked to do a study Bible on that. We're studying that, pro the, that project very seriously as a possibility. Because again, that impacts your hermeneutics, which affects the whole cycle. Because your hermeneutics will impact your eschatology, which will sharpen your understanding of ecclesiology, which in turn will drive you more and more to taking a higher view of the text itself. As you discover more and more its supernatural uh, characteristics. I thought you'd be interested in that. In any case, all of these always point to what? The Messiah. You betcha. Okay. Well, we made it, gang. So next time, I want you to study chapter 2. But as you do, I want you to come to your own conclusions about what it was that was upsetting him so much that Paul had to write 2 Thessalonians. Was it that they had missed the rapture, or was it something else? Or is it that Paul taught them falsely? Maybe they thought he was misteaching them. These are questions I want you to answer for yourself. And I, obviously you can infer that if they were post-trib, they wouldn't have been upset. So it tells you something about the eschatology that they were embracing, or they wouldn't have been upset. But the other question you want to ask yourself, what's the sequence of the eschatological events? Where's the rapture? Where is the Antichrist? When does he get revealed? When does he come to power? When does he break the covenant? What starts the great tribulation? Where does Jesus come in all of that? How are you going to lay that out? 
And who is this strange restrainer? There's a restrainer, it's going to be removed. Who could that possibly be? You might even make a list of candidates. Well, maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. Make a list. Make as long a list as you can. And I'll show you why it has to be, there's only one that fits the bill. But you want to go through that exercise to really understand, you won't really understand the answer if you don't understand the question. But I'm going to leave you with a challenge. You know, when I do public studies, I usually throw this out there. I'm going to do it here tonight because I think it fits the situation. I'm going to put something on the screen, which if you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I want you to challenge this preposterous statement I'm going to put on the screen. That you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in human history including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now that's a preposterous statement that the Bible is talking about the period of time we're entering with more detail, with more, there's more said about it than any other period in, the, in, in history. Now that's preposterous. If you accept that, you flunk. How do you challenge that? You've got to do two things. You've got to first of all find out what the Bible really says. Not what your paraphrase conjectures not what the Jesus Seminar voted on that he said or didn't say by their... Uh, anyway. No, this is not to be delegated to others. Find out for yourself what the Bible says. Now you have an example. Uh, you have an unusual exemplar situation today. The environment you have today is the most phenomenal environment in the history of mankind. The Word of God is more read, available to every one of us than it has ever been on the planet Earth before. Because we have advanced information appliances. Many people carry in their phone half a dozen different Bibles searchable in Greek or Hebrew. You can, uh, you can find out in a few moments with your information appliances. In, in less than a half an hour, you can learn more than a pastor could learn in, in a whole week in a library years ago. Um, the, 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 and it's all free, by the way. Some of it can cost money, doesn't need to. If you have a basic appliance, almost everything you want is available free of charge. And of course there's the internet. All of man's knowledge is available to you with a few keystrokes if you know how to use it. And that includes biblical knowledge. And of course the other thing you have today are small groups. I have not, in my 60 years of being a Christian, the place I've seen people invariably grow is in small groups, 6 to 12. Small enough to answer questions, uh, to ask questions without embarrassment. Small enough to hold each other accountable. More than 12, it starts to become something else. That's not bad, but different. Okay, that's item one. Find out what the Bible really says. Not what Chuck Missler says, what the Bible really says. But the second thing you've got to do won't happen automatically. It takes some diligence. Find out what's really going on, and you will not have any chance of understanding what's going on by watching the, week, the evening news broadcast. Because it's prostituted to an agenda of their own. Tragically. It's one of the many areas of corruption that is destroying our, the entire fabric of our society. The corruption in the press, the corruption in our schools, the corruption in our courts, the corruption in our, very, in our political system. Okay. Okay. Find out what's really going on. Pilate re so cynically asked, what is truth? Well, we're asking the same question. Find out what's true. Yes, you can answer. Well, Christ is the, the, the uh, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, but that's not a cliche. That's a very important fundamental statement. You don't resolve this with cliches. What you've got to do is find out what's really true. Everything you see has got a bias. Everything you use, everything you've got has an agenda. You've got to sift through that to figure out what's really going on. Crucial. Because we live in the age of deceit. And Satan's primary weapon for your destruction is deceit. And don't be surprised when you find that deceit in the pulpits. You need to be armed yourself with the Word of God. You need to be able to discern. Well, what's your action plan? What's God calling you to do? How many of you are saved? Can I see a show of hands? Praise God. My next question is, what have you done with it? Why were you saved? It was to bear fruit. Lots of Scripture. You can drown you in Scriptures on that one. You weren't saved to put your feet on a desk and be a silent witness. 
as A. Allen used to say, apparently, um, if, you were, if you were on trial for being Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? I'm going to suggest that God is not finished with any one of us. That we, every one of us, me included, are a work in progress. And I suggest we all need to raise the bar on a personal walk. We're in a new year here. We're celebrating a year. Every time I write a checkbook, I can't believe the year I have to put down. I haven't gotten ready. I haven't gotten used to the last one. I got a new one here already. The question is, am I progressing spiritually? Is my spiritual hygiene, my spiritual condition today any different than it was a year ago? What an indictment if there hasn't been some advance. Raise the bar on your personal walk. How do you do that? Well, it includes a lot of things, getting rid of the baggage that you probably should shed, but it's also, it's going to involve, for sure, committing yourself to a systematic program to really learn your Bible. Well, I read it every day. That's devotional reading. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a systematic study, verse by verse, and it's a lifetime deal. I read the Bible through once. Only once? No, no. Study it. Don't just read it. Study it. Understand it. Commit yourself. That's a lifetime quest. It's a treasure hunt. It's one of the most satisfying things you'll ever do. The more you learn about it, the more you'll enjoy it. The more you enjoy it, the more you'll learn about it. The other thing you want to do, the way you want to do that, you can do a systematic program on your own. Some people, few of us can do that on our own, get, make some progress. Most of us don't. Most of us do better in a small group. Having a partner, two or three, and doing it together, whatever. That's one reason in the Institute now that the children of a parent, if the parent's a member, uh, are, are, are enrolled free. They can be getting college credit when they're still in their teens, whatever. Anyway, join or start, if you can't find one, a small study group. That's where people, you don't have to be a, a teacher to, to lead a group. You pop a DVD of the thing and talk about it a little bit. Anyone can lead a discussion and make sure that one person doesn't dominate and have everybody, you know, there's, there's tricks to make it successful and so forth. But start a small group. But whatever you do, I'm going to encourage every one of you to pray about it and whatever God calls you to do, just respond right now. I mean, today, think about it, pray about it, and, and commit yourself to a program for your coming king. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.